Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We're going to give everyone just another minute to join and then we'll get started. All right. Well, I think we, we gave our obligatory uh, 60 seconds for everyone to start joining into the webinar. Um, again, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. We're really excited to speak with you. Um, ultimately, so um, it's a live webinar with a panel um, goal of today. So Grad 2020 performance results and a look into the future. So my name is Bill Windsor. I'm VP of Solutions at Gobi and the moderator for today. Um, the 2020 GRESP season has come to a close. Uh, it was definitely an interesting year, I think, all around, but the results were really promising. Uh, it was another record-breaking year for GRESP submissions with more than 1,200 funds around the world um, submitting their ESG data and performance details, which was a 22% increase over 2019, despite disruptions of, of COVID-19. So congratulations to the, the GRESP team and to our participants. Um, but during today's session, so what we're going to plan to do is um, we're lucky enough to have an amazing panel that I'll introduce here in just a second. Uh, we're going to let Dan uh, from GRESB start with a brief overview from the results presented last week and touch on anything new and upcoming with GRESB into 2021. And then um, open discussion with our panel of their 2020 GRESB experience, but really share some best practices and future ESG plans. Um, we'll also open up the session to questions from viewers and across our panelists. Our session today will run about 50 minutes in length and will be recorded and we'll send it over to all participants. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. So we have Natalie Tier from the West Coast, VP Sustainability and Social Impact at Hudson Pacific Properties. They've reported to grads specifically for over three years, but among other benchmarks as well. Um, and in grads scored in the top um, quintile of the entire grads universe for the past two years. So it's a five star rating, which is really impressive. And then we have Sarah Young, Senior Manager of Portfolio at Trademark Property and um, 2020 grads real estate development sector leader for retail in America, which is also really exciting and also a third year participant. From the Gobi team, we also have Aaron Visalia, who is our Associate ESG Manager here at Gobi and one of our in-house grads and ESG experts. And he who needs no introduction, but um, Dan Winters, head of America at Grez. So last quick thing before we get started, um, again, please feel free, any questions throughout the session in the bottom right corner, we're gonna answer as many as we can um, during our session for today. So with that being said, Dan, I'm gonna start us off with you. Um, 2020 has uh, been an interesting year, um, but for our listeners who maybe couldn't attend the results webinar last week, what are some key takeaways from the year and what does 2021 look like for GRES? Well, Michelle, you almost stole my thunder there, right? So, um, you know, I think the big takeaway is, you know, and I started this with our results event last time, right? ESG has tremendous momentum and it had that coming into the year and then as I reflected back upon January and February, right? And so my job is typically to spend time in the, at the conferences. And so IREI, VIP Americas, PREA, Spring Meeting, the NAREIT ESG Forum, these were all packed events. So at NAREIT, they had 50% increase of, of participants in, in their ESG forum, right? 150 people showed up. And what's interesting to me is you're seeing more folks, not just the ESG people, which, which get together and, and share best practices and are really a good solid group. But now it's attracting more uh, of the investor relations uh, team and they're wanting to understand what's going on, how to communicate these metrics and it's really sort of driving it, driving the interest within the firms. So if I think about IREI, that's a private equity group as is uh, the Prius spring meeting. And at each of those events, whatever the topic was of the panel, they always devolved or, or, or moved into ESG issues. It was pretty amazing to see. And so there we were early early March, uh, the previous spring meeting was in Los Angeles, and then what, this pandemic hit, right? So uh, uh, that changed every, everything. And for us, it was a bit of a scramble to get our most important thing that we need to do at any year, which is on April 1st, open up that portal, right? So we were able to do that. We're a distributed organization and, and we moved that, um, you know, we moved everybody into, 
into uh, uh, scramble mode and we delivered that. But the more important thing was being able to deliver some online training to folks because you know that's what we normally do on a get together person in Chicago with you and in New York and other places and, and Gobi's been a great host all along the way. So being able to pivot and, and deliver training online was, was also a, an important milestone for us. We at that point started to hear from the industry, right? Oh my goodness, that we were totally disrupted. And what are you doing about the timelines? We were able to reverse engineer uh, a bunch of deadlines and contracts and whatnot to extend the deadline until August 1st. And that started to push everything back in, 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 you know, in, in our deliveries. So here we are now, uh, the second quarter was okay. The third quarter was a little bumpy. Uh, in, in getting the results out. We had some errors that, that showed up in the benchmark reports, but the good news is that we implemented this review period. And we had 1,230 sets of eyeballs looking at everybody's benchmark reports and things elevated, first from Australia, then here in the US, the EU, right, the UK folks. And they're like, well, how we're seeing some weirdness with our like for like calculations. So we were able to step back, fix those things and, and reissue. The whole reason why this was going on is two years ago, we just started to make this pivot. What is performance? And what we did is we carved out the management component of Grez and the performance component of Grez and the development component of Grez. Well, this basically had us reinventing and rebuilding the airplane while flying it. And uh, I don't recommend doing that, particularly in a pandemic when other things are happening. Um, so, so third quarter was a little rocky. Uh, fourth quarter, all is all is well again. So we were able to do benchmark reports. The benchmark reports have changed. You're seeing that there's some some new graphics and, and and things that are in there to really more granularly slice and dice how peer groups are, are how peers are doing against one another and. Um, uh, really being able to get into things like GHG emissions and energy water waste, right? We're seeing more folks being able to report waste data. That was really uh, nice to see, particularly from the Canadians. Um, and so here we are into December, uh, getting to what, what has been the longest year for, I think, pretty much all of us in our professional lives. And um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking ahead. 2021 is going to be a solid year. We're now embarking, well, oh, yeah, we also had this little thing that happened, not only a pandemic and not only uh, uh, rebuilding the airplane while flying it, but we had a small transaction. And so we we did a management buyout. And so now Grez is setting a chart, uh, a course forward for 2021. And the, the key thing with this is that we've taken the standard and we're, we're putting it in a foundation that's based in the Netherlands. And that is governed by institutional investors and all of our benchmark committees, all of our governance groups will live in this. And what we're doing and what's exciting to me is we're gonna to start to define what is performance together with the industry. So here we are, what has been performance for a decade? It's been, can you acquire the energy, water, waste, and greenhouse gas emission data? You ask an organization that in 2012, and you know they're like, maybe I can get the spend, but boom, my head's exploding. How are we gonna acquire that data, right? And so you have good partners in Gobi, there's, there's a whole ecosystem out there of folks that want to help you acquire this data and not only um, get the data, but assure it, make sure it's good, high quality with lineage and it's timely. And, uh, you know, so you can do uh, you know, a, a good service for your clients, right? We have institutional investors that are carbon footprinting their portfolios, right? They signed the Montreal Pledge in 2014. And so an example of that would be CalPERS. Kelpers signed that pledge, they joined Grezb in 2016, and they asked all of their real estate fund managers, which they have 11 up, to start to participate in Grezb so they can raise their, their game when it comes to data availability and data quality. They did the same thing on the infrastructure side. So when they issued that carbon report last year, they had good quality data from their real asset portfolios, real estate and infrastructure, and uh, that, that proved very, very you know, beneficial to that organization. And so at the end of the day, people that are their fund managers, the listed property companies that CalPERS has positions in, they were able to start to report that data to them, worked out great. So now as we're looking ahead, performance is obviously a lot more than just can you acquire data. We're in this year where COVID has happened and it's really disrupted the real estate industry. So looking at like for like performance, 
and and things it's it's going to be weird let's just call it what it is 2021 is going to come up with some some strangeness in our data whether you're an office company a retail company whatever your property type and holdings are so we're together through the foundation and through our, our governance groups uh we're going to start on this uh journey if you will of what does performance look like and, and how is that recognized and rewarded within grids now the great news i'm being joined by a couple of, of real all-star companies right and one of them has stepped forward in a, in a big way and did a number of, of steps to move towards net zero Grez didn't really recognize those accomplishments as well as it could have this year but we always have to meet the industry where it's at so we've got some groups that have been participating in Grez for a long time they're five star they're four star right they've raised their game from the uh you know maybe a, a poor grade if you will on uh, the public disclosure all the way up to A's, that's awesome. So we want to now take this momentum and start to define together what performance looks like in the industry. And that's really where we're heading. We don't have the answers, we believe that the industry does. And so uh, working groups and, and our various governance group, uh, committees and, and, and uh, you know, our trade association friends are gonna help us with that. So that's what the next 24 months looks like, right? We're gonna take those things in chunks I'm confident that the, the assessment will stay relatively stable for 2021. So whatever we did this year, we're gonna continue to do the same thing next year with the one component of the resilience module where we still have designs to try to uh, you know, bake that into everything within the existing assessment. However, what was nice about that module is it really mapped well to the TCFDs. So, a uh, little bit ahead of our skis because next week is when we have these benchmark committee meetings uh both in australia well both in australia and in the united states the eu and the uk so we're going to be getting some feedback from those groups and that will set our chart for 2021. so with that that's just some general highlights i'm confident that we'll answer some more things as this webinar continues michelle can i turn back to you yeah, absolutely. And that was a fantastic overview going all the way back to reminiscing about the days of in-person conferences and what that looks like and getting out of my house. So um, yes, thank you for that. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of really great components in what you were giving in terms of an overview. Um, and I'm excited to kind of dive into each of those actually with, with our great panelist group here. Um, you talked a lot about performance, so maybe that's a, a great starting point. So I think we've seen this really strong emphasis of tracking performance. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll really start with Sarah and Natalie here. What, um, maybe Natalie, you first, um, but how have you found this, this shift, this kind of change? I think we've really seen it over the last year more than anything of focusing on performance you know has this really changed your overall programming and decisions and your communication um on those initiatives uh, overall when i think it's 100 percent the right move performance is what matters and that is what we should all be moving towards and um you know not all of the esg ratings frameworks out there are doubling down on performance and so it's really great to see grez doing that um and it's tricky, as you were talking about, Dan, it's really hard to figure out a way that uh, rewards performance across in a fair way across an industry. Um, that the benefit that GRESP has compared to other ESG frameworks is that it is focused on one industry. So although every subsector is different, there are, you know, build it, there are there's a lot of coherence that you get just because everyone's dealing with buildings in some way or another and so that probably is one reason why GRESP has been able to move towards performance ahead of other ESG ratings frameworks um, some of the questions that I expect you'll be tackling in the upcoming benchmarking benchmark meetings and and, and I, over the next few years because it's going to take time I know is you know are the things that we're really focused on and you mentioned us is a you know, for example, we're a, um, a, well, I should say, just by way of background, HUD specific, we're a mid-size REIT, we're uh, 20 million square feet of class A commercial office and studio space on the west coast of North America. So we have a different value proposition than many other REITs or real estate organizations. And um, so 
that said, it, it has been easier for us to move fast in, um, in, in a lot of areas in terms of data, both in terms of data coverage and performance. Um, but one thing we have done, it is move fast. We Last year, we converted to 100% renewable electricity. And a few months ago, we announced we did hit our net zero target um, several years early. And um, we're really proud of, of that. I'll tell you, like, that's what I cared about more than anything else. No offense to you, Dan, or the Gresb organization, but much more, I care much more about us hitting net zero than doing any ESG reporting. However, I'm a little like that to be reflected. Right? So awesome. Keep it up. No, go ahead. All right. So then you get into this question of, okay, well, you know, you would assume that that gets reflected in ESG ratings and the truth is that it, it doesn't yet. There are a lot of um, ways that the ratings and Gresb and others are set up that they don't um, necessarily recognize leadership and performance in the same way because it's so, A, because performance is just one part. There is also the management piece, but also because performance, at least right now, and the way that it's structured is based on incremental year-over-year -year improvements and an organization that makes really big reduction in one year um, you kind of cap out on how much that can in increase your score. There isn't really a, a, a mechanism for bonus points or a, you know, a, if, if you do a real leadership move. Um, that's one thing I'm sure that you'll be exploring in the upcoming benchmark meetings. Um, Caught us on the wrong year. You stepped forward at, that, at the pivot point when we were rebuilding the airplane. So good on you. We're going to what? make the poster child of net zero. Is that okay? I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Right. And it would be great to see. I mean, and Aaron and I were talking about like, oh my gosh, like what, are, what does that even mean when we report this year? Is, are we just going to be all zeros everywhere? And then what are we going to be able to get important? Because how do you improve your like for like? There is no year over year performance improvement if you're only, you know, our scope one and two are going to be zero forever. Now, hopefully we don't go back on that commitment. Um, right. So yeah. So how do you set up a framework that rewards that um, as well as that kind of really fast improvement because for that example I gave was when we last year when we converted to 100% renewable electricity that got rid of all of our scope two emissions it brought our total carbon footprint down essentially by 80% in one year and from a grass perspective like it didn't help our score any more than it would have if we had done a 10% year over year improvement right so how are there are there mechanisms where you know there actually is a difference? There are bonus points available for go, you know going to 80% instead of 10%. I just got I got need to interrupt and let the audience know that we're talking to an A student, if you will, right? <laughs> so five star, strong <laughs> score, leader in the peer group. We're we're splitting hairs, right? You're you're doing all the right things, and 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 I know that the scores in the year that they retreated a little bit. You know, on the on the margin, you might have had points that weren't quite as high as the year before, but it didn't matter. Everybody else fell backwards, and you're still a five star. So keep it up. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, yeah. I mean, if anything, it's a really good problem that we're having with this. Um, so I'm always a fan of good problems. But I, you know, I think to to Natalie's point, it's what does that next stage look like? Which is why we're excited to have, you know, Natalie join it as well from, from that perspective. And so, Dan, you're now on the case in your <laughs> meetings next week um, for, I like bonus points. I'm a fan. <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> um, but Sarah, I'm going to turn the question over to you as well, because um, kind of opposite of, you know, Natalie, as she had mentioned, she's on the West Coast. She's mostly office. There's great accessibility to data. Um, from the trademark trademark property side as, as retail and kind of spread throughout different regions, um, you have a different perspective and challenge as it relates to performance. And so I'm really curious to hear your perspective as well, because I feel like that's actually more reflective of quite a few um, that are out there today as well. I was just about to say, I love hearing the A students like uh, take on things though, because that's like where my trajectory is, is like, let's learn from our peers and what are they doing really well? Um, yeah, Trademark is a small boutique firm, privately owned company in Fort Worth, Texas, and mainly our portfolio is retail. Um, for me, just knowing that the, not being a little unsure of what the scoring changes were going to do to um, our benchmark score, I really wanted to just kind of cover everything really well as best that I could. Um, so I did focus a lot on performance, but also put equal weight um, on the other components as well. Yeah, and I think we were excited to see too. 
Go ahead, Dan, oh, sorry. No, what I learned from Sarah is if we put a little uncertainty out there, right? Because we're really transparent. <laughs> questions are you know what our scoring looks like it's all out there on the web right but we did we were you know as we did this management thing and then this performance thing over here and we were splitting it up right it kind of got people a little nervous and so what happened is they got even more focused and we're really in there and so your results were great they were yes <laughs> thanks uh, I, I don't know that the scare tactic is the way to go but <laughs> Board with it, sure. um, and and Aaron, maybe from the Gobi side. So you you've been able to work across you know multiple teams. And um, what are some of the trends that that you saw through this process? Are there other benefits that maybe are across some of our other teams that are with more transparent data? Transparency is always great, right? This time <laughs> it can be. So the I think for the performance question on on how did that change programming for a lot of my clients, it was. It was finally now worth it to tackle tenant data collection. Now seeing how many points it is for the performance section, how many points are left hanging by not collecting that tenant data and how many points are really associated with coverage. They're now like, okay, let's take a step back. We've said no to you every time you've asked us in the past years of, oh, do you guys wanna you know, collect for the indirectly managed properties? It was always no, but now it's, yes like we need to do this we need to engage with our tenants we need to figure out a way that's not so burdensome on them but allow them to see like the benefits of it which is you know if, if the owners can track the data they can also help reduce the energy use and the water use and that really only benefits the tenants so that has been helpful in starting the conversation and it's really because of this year because of the change in emphasis on performance that that took off so i'm excited to see where that goes in 2021 um, I mean, other things like that, it, it's right to have data collection be the first part, you know, like that is without it, you can't do anything. You can't set targets. You can't know how much, you know, carbon offsets you need to purchase. Like that is the first step, but you know, that's where some people are. Other people are way past that, you know, like Natalie is saying, but for now, I think that is still where people are we're still that's where we're meeting the industry right now is trying to get that data and I would like to see like pressure on utilities to keep releasing that data and I don't know who that will come from maybe our new administration will help I'm not sure but you know people with properties primarily in the benchmarking ordinance cities they have an advantage because utilities have a way to get that data to them people who aren't they don't so it would be great to see that release of data available across all cities uh, i don't know you know where that pressure would come from maybe us maybe higher up i'm not sure but that would be great and then that also allows people to really you know if they know what they have they can manage it and then that also opens all the doors to reporting frameworks it could be grasp tcfd you know gri like you can actually use the data in meaningful ways and that's what i see the benefit of this you know being the performance should be what is the main focus 317 portfolios that participated in North America this year. And I think that the pressure is a collective groundswell, right? And so mm -hmm. as more folks are you know, asking data from utilities, it's it, hopefully that pressure in and of itself, our collective you know, shared purpose, if you will, uh, will really come to fore. It was heartening for me to hear you talk about you know, the, the push for tenant data, because that's an engagement. And we have split incentive problems. You know, whose carbon is it? Uh, gee, I want to invest in LED lighting, but the tenant's going to get the benefit. That drives green lease in conversations. All of those things are things that we've all wanted. And so, to the whatever the forcing mechanism to make those things happen or, or, or get momentum behind them, seems like we're going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, you know, I have. I, that's one of the benefits, I think, of a lot of these benchmarks and frameworks that are out there when it comes to benchmark, even down to benchmarking ordinances, when it comes to grads, when it comes to these others, is it's really pushing the industry forward, um, which I think is exciting to, to see. And we're seeing some of those benefits compared to, as I think it was Dan that said, compared to like 2016, where we are today, um, which is really exciting. Um, well, with that, while we have kind of performance on, on the brain, um, you know, I think we're seeing across the industry concerns of what does 2021 look like as related to performance? I mean, across the board on the 
on, on the office side? Is anyone in the office? Maybe some, maybe not. Um, you know, are there other things we're doing at these buildings associated with bringing in more outside air? Are we tracking occupancy in that sense? Same with like on the retail. That's why I'm really excited for kind of the two sides of the panelists that we have of some areas retail has been hit hard, some areas it's been opening. And then, um, you know, Dan, how do we, how do you, how do you give points for all of this? You know, at the end of the day, we care about the points. I know we're not going to give you too much pressure. You're, you're, you're still in decide, decision mode, but um, maybe I'll, I'll start with the panelists as it relates to that question before I give Dan the hard one. Um, but, uh, Natalie, like, I know this is on your radar. Can um, talk about from your perspective of what is that communication looking like right now? What are things you guys are focusing on to address what performance tracking looks like from last year to compared into 2021? Yeah, well, I think in some ways COVID is forcing a really important conversation in, you know, in this world. And it's not just CRES, right? I mean, you have the EPA and Energy Star Program and others struggling with the exact same issues. But, um, you know, forcing this conversation around, how do you adjust for external factors in a way that makes like for like comparisons actually meaningful, right? And so how do you adjust for, for weather? How do you adjust for occupancy? Do it in a fair and unbiased way that's also efficient and actually re reasonable for, I mean, we, we can do it because we're mid-size and, kind of, and we're vertically integrated. I have a handle on our portfolio, um, but some of the really big funds, I mean, to do that at scale is, really challenging. So um, I'm not saying these are easy issues, but I do feel like moving towards more adjustments um, will make like for like comparisons more meaningful and will will give integrity to the whole performance score. Otherwise, I think that there is a real risk that it just becomes a wash and people stop caring about it because they know it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and Sarah, you have kind of a same, I think everyone's going to have the same concerns same um issues we'll say so to speak but also from different perspectives and from like the retail industry right now can you lend some of your thoughts on what that communication is looking like um internally and externally on your end also yeah i mean even when you think about just stay at home orders and closures i mean we had some malls that were closed months longer than others and so i think when you think about the like for like like how do you compare when when they're all in your portfolio together that you have some that were on a completely different opening timeline than others that you know how are we going to look at that in 2021 is a big question mm -hmm. yeah and then dan here comes your hard question so how any insights that we can start to gleam or you know telling us we're still figuring it out is okay too but any thoughts to what grez will be looking at in terms of how to account for this heading in to the net new year, because although we'll probably see impact in some way or fashion across all the participants, they're each being impacted slightly differently. Exactly as Sarah said, you know, she's got regional differences or you have asset type differences or even all the retails aren't gonna look the exact same. So um, what are some things that you know of today or that Grez is planning to look at for how to address that into next year? Well, you know, look, it's, it's definitely too early. We want to take the pulse of the industry. so. This is a great start and next week will be uh, an equally good start. The good news is that this is a worldwide phenomenon, so it's affecting everybody. It does affect differently, we get it. I like what Nat how Natalie has been able to navigate Hudson, which is you know, focus on carbon. I honestly believe that's where the focus will be, right? Yeah. So Life for Life is all about you know, trying to tease out, did you make some intervention today that you know, is is driving down some energy spend or some energy consumption, and then shows up and like the like. Okay, well, that's one method and one way to do it. The other thing is, how do you navigate to net zero? So that's a component of it, but there's more, right? Where do you procure your energy from? That's equally important, if not more so. And it doesn't have to be a capex; it's an opex, right? The COVID is affecting opex, not capex. So. I think the data is going to look weird, and, and I, the point about Energy Star, absolutely, it's going to affect Canada, the, the folks that are, are, you know, going into winter time right now. But you have people coming into the buildings, you're going to be blasting in fresh air as much as you can, and that's going to cause energy spend to go up, and that's going to cause utilities to go up, and, and consumption. 
And it frankly, and to that point, Dan, and that's exactly why we pulled our decarb strategy forward, is we saw what was happening. We had a plan to get there over several years, and we saw what COVID was going to do to our energy use. We knew we were in Canada and Seattle and plenty of places where we're going to be running a lot. Uh, just everyone's running their HVAC longer and harder than ever before, right? And we're for us, the line in the sand was, you know, we our energy use can go up, but our carbon footprint cannot go up. Like, no way, we're not going up. So the answer was to decouple it completely and just get to net zero, and then we will work on energy um, as appropriate in a way that's actually safe. We're not going to compromise safety. That's also a line we're not going to cross. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, Natalie, one of the questions that came in was just um, diving into a little bit more on how you, you hit your net zero um, target. Um, it sounds like, you know, it was a lot of that through kind of some of the purchasing of renewable energy that you guys were doing, um, was yeah. it driving some energy efficiency, uh, just as like a lesson learned for those that are out there going after that goal. Um, can you touch on a few recommendations and how you guys are doing it? Yeah, it's, you know, pulling is that a whole little... other webinar? <laughs> no, I mean, the short, yeah, there, there are a lot of things that went into it. Energy efficiency, really focusing on um, building specific improvements and, and we use, um, our energy start certifications as a proxy for how, how well we're succeeding on that front. Um, and those have gone way up across the portfolio. Also our prop tech and innovation pipeline, really focusing on things like on-site renewables and energy storage. And, um, and then, and then it was really about energy procurement. Um, so we, at a lot of our sites, because we're West coast, we're, fortunate to have direct contracts available um, and in place already or accessible to us at a reasonable price with our local utilities um, that are fully renewable, you know, green power agreements. And then where that wasn't possible, we used offsite um, renewable energy credits from a, a wind farm in Texas. And that took care of all of our scope two emissions. And then um, the, the piece that we accelerated into this year, once we saw COVID was hitting was our um, car carbon offset strategy which addresses, which effectively negated all of our scope one emissions. Awesome. It's an exciting um, feat. Um, so we're, we're absolutely excited to, maybe we'll, we'll have a whole nother webinar with you of like, okay, we did it. Now what? <laughs> How do we maintain this? <laughs> Lessons learned on, on that front. Um, Perfect. Well, I, I think from here, I'm going to go ahead and dive into, there's another few specific questions that had kind of come up through either prior to uh, the webinar, um, as well as that I see coming in. So I'm going to maybe dive into some of these, if that's okay with everyone. Um, specifically, I want to talk about the resiliency model module um, and really what resiliency means holistically <laughs> even beyond just GRAS. Um, but it's, in you know, in light of everything happening with COVID, um, are, I'm really curious to hear from the panelists and even Dan from you on is resiliency being viewed differently? Are you seeing um, kind of a change in, in that conversation that's happening, um, A, because of COVID, but how that's really being reflected within ESG? I know we've been seeing it on conversations and uptick in questions, and um, but maybe, you know, Sarah, I might ask you first on um, resiliency specifically and how that's being impacted. Where, where are you really kind of seeing that shift maybe? Well, I feel like the conversation at the beginning seemed like it was mainly um, just about like climate risk a lot. And now you're hearing, especially with COVID, you're just hearing about it in a really different social way that I think really opened the conversation up in a way that it hadn't been before um, and made it feel almost just more tangible to people um, in an everyday kind of way. Um, and I think it really just helps the conversation, um, especially knowing that it's going to be, you know, included in the module for 2021 i think that um it just helps you have those conversations yeah absolutely and you know aaron i might even from our team ask you as well i mean i've found that it now because of covid it's having these conversations are just easier it's always been we've had to make the case of why um and a lot of that why comes from a risk mitigation standpoint and sometimes it's hard to like put that in front of people of like no 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 this is to prepare for these components, um, and COVID is one of those components. Um, so, Erin, maybe from your perspective, you know, from our clients and us helping to frame those conversations, any other thoughts or what you're seeing on your end? Yeah, I would say this year, in the past years, we've, you know, talked to clients like, hey, do you want to pursue this optional module? And a lot of them like, oh, we don't do anything for that. 
like they're just like no and I'm like this is the first year we sat down and we're like you you have to be doing things like that because it's occurring like you have to have a business continuity plan like your properties have to have you know things in place to deal with like their tenants their occupants and it that opened the conversation to everything else they actually are doing it's just like the frame I think maybe when they thought resilience like oh that's a new era of sustainability that we're not into yet but they are like everyone is doing something for resiliency it's just it's less known, it's less like top of mind. So I think this year with COVID, with talking about social risks in the pandemic, it did help frame the start of the conversation that led to us like learning a lot more about what they actually are doing and they didn't even realize was applicable here. So I, I do think it'll be helpful. And I also really pushed everyone because it's going to become in the actual survey. So it was like, let's just see what you have. Yeah. Uh, One thing Natalie, go ahead, yeah. Just to chime in on this, I do, I think it's great that we're, there is a more a focus on resilience in general. And, and for sure, I mean, if you look at the investor world, TCFD is the most talked about issue at the moment. So this is aligns with what's happening in the investor community. My personal gripe, however, with the framing of resilience in, in GRES, but, but also in the, this is true in the um, TCFD framework as well, um, is that for a lot of companies, um, these issues are, are not just a risk, they're an opportunity. And, and often they're more of an opportunity, climate in particular for us, it's an opportunity. We think that in many ways, carbon is already priced into our business. We have already converted to net zero, which has negated pretty much all of the transition risks that we're facing at the mo moment. So when we, we do our scenario analyses, the, the downside is actually fairly minimal to us at the moment, the, uh, but there is huge upside. And, and that's aligned with our business strategy. That's the niche that we're going after. Um, and, and we're not alone in that space. So I, I would love to see the conversation around this topic. And I don't even want to use the word resilience because it implies the downside, right? Is I would love to see, and CDC does a good job of this, of, to really talk about the upside as well. Yeah, and Dan, from your perspective, I know you commented a little bit of resilience um, in your initial opening, but additional comments from you on this also well so let's let's step back and think about what these modules are meant to do so we started five years ago i believe with the health and well-being module so what this is is an emerging topic that's not captured within the assessment framework as it is and we we come up with 10 questions and we throw it out there it's optional so you are already dealing with people that have survey fatigue and so it's to Aaron's point, right? Oh, you should do it. Oh, we're tired. Oh, it doesn't matter to us, right? So, okay, so you get some volunteers, if you will, that from the 1,230 that step forward and, and do this. That's a learning moment for grads. So then in the second year of a module, we take that learning and we say, oh, okay, well, here's what some leaders or some people in the industry are thinking about. And granted, some people just do it because they stumble in and say, oh, there's more questions. Okay, I'll do these. No, 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 and they get a zero. That's happened. Either way, we learn some things, we, we iterate on the questions, and then we elevate. And then the third year, we score it with the idea that we make it the assessment into the various questions as, as sort of answer options, if you will. So what I heard from Aaron is, and this was the third year now of the resilience module. So we would be on a trajectory to do what we did with the health and well-being module, bake it in. But what I heard from Aaron is a case to kind of leave it there and see if more people uh, you know, think about it. Because at the end of the day, where Grez shines is the whole idea of an annual assessment, wash, rinse, repeat, have a management team think about the issues, every one of the aspects within Grez, things in the module, get some results, look at those results, do some management introspection, and decide what makes business sense for them in their context to make progress. So to the extent that the resilience module, and I'm just gonna argue both sides of it, can live as a standalone, it will put more management teams through that process, get them thinking about it. If we take it and bake it in, well, it's gonna be part of lots of different things within the assessment. So these are best practices that show up in underwriting, right? So how many people do a, a climate risk analysis in their underwriting, either transition risk or physical risk? It's an emerging topic and I'm watching people, uh, you know, bring these memos forward in their investment committee so that's how these practices elevate and diffuse and that's our goal yeah and i think we've seen um you know you mentioned about health and well-being i think that's another good example too of how we've seen 
that actually, you know, be moved forward successfully within GRASP. And it did the exact same thing, you know, it brought additional conversation to light and then it was, you know, inserted into the rest of the, the portfolio. Um, and I personally think, you know, the social and the resilience, I think now you touched on it, it's really all, it's all intertwined. It's all together. Um, it's a little bit of also the risk mitigation, but looking for opportunities for growth and improvements as well. And what the positive ben benefit and impact can be. So, um, Switching gears a little bit with that kind of still in mind, but I, I'd love to spend a few minutes talking about just the, the social initiatives that are happening right now. I think in addition to the, the global pandemic, we also had, you know, a lot of social initiatives that were happening, especially here in the States. And um, there's, I think, some really great positive things that can come out of that. And just looking at, you know, big picture, um, you know, Natalie, again, maybe I'll start with you here. You know, what is it that, that you are really focused on in terms of, um, the, the initiatives associated with social. I love that you have like social impact in your name, like that. that is in your title, it's a key aspect of it. Um, what recommendations would you maybe have for our viewers of what you're starting to focus on or even metrics you're starting to, to touch on? I personally find the metrics of social, just those two words don't go well together in my head, but um, how are you addressing this um, currently at Hudson? Well, that's funny to say that about my title. My, um, I joined Hudson a year and a half ago and before this I, um, never worked in real estate. I was in other sectors, mostly retail, consumer, and healthcare um, sectors, but doing ESG work the whole time. Um, and when I was in those other sectors, people used the word sustainability interchangeably with ESG, with corporate responsibility, with purpose, with mission. It was understood that sustainability was a, a, um, incorporated, inclusive of the S, I think, more often than not. And I was surprised when I um, moved into real estate that it, it really, in real estate, it really just means E, the E. Mm -hmm. um, and that the sector in general does not really talk, has not thought that much. The sector is, I think, more advanced on the E than a lot of other sectors, but is way behind other se sectors on the S. And so for me, once I kind of figured that out, I've actually really pushed hard to get that social impact in my title because I wanted it to be clear to everyone that I do have a cross-functional role. And it's never been more important. I mean, we the, the, our ESG strategy that we've, we've built is has three pillars and intentionally they span um, the sustainability and social impact sides and it's sustainability, health and equity. Um, and well, and I'll, this year I've spent most of my time, even though we've hit net zero, I'll say the vast majority of my hours have been on health and equity, dealing with the COVID crisis, navigating through that, navigating through our approach to racial equity and racial justice we have those have been top of mind to me and to our company even as we're hitting these really big environmental milestones um but i i feel it's critical that the social topics be on an equal playing field as the e in real estate and i would love to see the performance module in grads this is a, a plug for you dan to to see it ref, be reflective of, of a real balance and not just the, the e topics that are in there today. Um, a follow up to that, can you, what are some of those metrics that you are tracking for social? Just that, I mean, I've got a few that, you know, we are we're focusing on on our end, um, mm -hmm. but I love hearing it from, from individuals specifically, because I, I, I think we're seeing some trends in the same typical metrics, um, but mm -hmm. I'm also seeing a little bit of differentiation. So I'm really curious, like, what are you tracking today? What are those performance metrics that you look at as um, kind of moving forward your, your social initiative? Yeah, we're, and what, to be honest, our, our data maturity here is less advanced than our E. So a lot of the metrics we're tracking, we're not disclosing publicly yet. Um, we do disclose our um, EEO one data um, at a company level. We disclose that publicly. Internally, we also track it at a management level. Um, uh, and we track um, also things like hours, hours of training in general, hours of DEI training that are distributed across the organization. That's all on the DEI topic. Um, the, our other main priority under the equity pillar is homelessness, which is a crisis issue in all of our cities. So there's we have a, tar a commitment to donate 1% of net earnings to charitable causes every year. I track that, so our charitable giving really closely. And within that, a lot of that is dedicated towards homelessness. And I'm tracking, I'm trying to boost up the percentage of our giving that's focused on homelessness every year. Um, so we, we can be more strategic about that. We also track things like 
um, kind of policy and advocacy positions um, that we take and support and whether they pass or fail at the local level. We track um, hours of volunteering. Um, we track board seats that our um, members have in, in local community organizations. Um, so I, I think there are, there's a lot of organizations and ways that we track impact. I, I definitely think that the sector as a whole hasn't aligned on what the meaningful metrics are. Yeah, and I, I don't think yet we found a, you know, Gres been, has really been a fantastic benchmark, I think, for real estate. And there are a lot focused, exactly as you said, on the E side in terms of metrics. We have Energy Star. There, um, I know there's other, you know, asset level certifications out there like Fit Well and Well, but there's nothing really out there today that's a benchmark of alignment to review against as it relates to the social and the governance side of metrics. There's a lot of this is a good place to be information that I think you can sometimes find, especially from the EU. Um, they, I think, are a little bit more vocal on here's some things to maybe strive for. Um, so I agree. I think as an industry, it'd be really exciting to to see that as the the next kind of standardization. And that's also a word I don't like with this, but um, you know maybe. Those at Gresb, uh, they're a little bit more familiar with with how to set that up, can come up with something a little bit more, um, uh, you know, intriguing for how to be able to do that effectively. Um, what we do is 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 capture what's happening out in the marketplace and try to reflect it back. So I'm glad you were recording this because I couldn't take notes. Natalie said there's a number of thoughtful things, and uh, you know the S is difficult without a doubt. In real estate, it's mostly been about affordable housing. Uh, sometimes it's about uh, you know what the construct of the company looks like as far as diversity and inclusion that way, right? And that means attracting people to real estate, uh, you know, from different walks of life. I was asked this question yesterday by somebody else, and you know, I, I kind of came around to the answer of I think that better decisions are made when you have people with different perspectives and different, you know, coming at things from a different way that all pile in and offer their, their perspectives and it leads to better outcomes. I truly believe that. And I watch it happen with our organization, right? We're 34 people of 16 different nationalities and 50, 50 male, female. So we typically, you know, over a, a process will make some good decisions and and i very much appreciate that and that's been my experience through the walk through life and i'm hopeful that that resonates with others that are listening yeah absolutely um well i know we're going to be coming close to the end here in just a minute so wanted to get a little bit more like forward thinking um you know let, let's let's leave 2020 maybe behind us um if as much as we can um you know maybe sarah i'll start with you here you know looking ahead into 2021 is there anything that you're really excited about um that you know that you're kind of putting your focus and your efforts on um heading into into next year yeah um we're definitely cleaning up our data even more i'm i'm kind of a perfectionist and i want it to be as good as it possibly can be so i'm putting a special focus kind of on data right now um within our portfolio but then also it's really just educating our teams educating our field teams our managers our employees about what esg is and how it affects them individually both as an employee of trademark as well as um, you know, working at a specific property or working in our corporate office. So when you guys were talking about social, um, it made me think about, um, you know, all the conversations that were happening over the summer about race led Trademark to start um, a kind of a diversity committee. We call it the IDEA Committee and its inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And so we're getting those voices um, you know, to be having conversations there, they've started their own newsletter there that come, comes out once or twice a month to all the employees with really interesting articles and all sorts of different things. So I think just um, kind of changing our culture um, in a way that includes these conversations, these ESG metrics as a part of the conversation is something that I'm looking forward to. That's one of my favorite things about our industry and um, is that I, I feel like we take some of these like crazy um, you know, global pandemic as the example, and we turn it into a positive impact. Like the goal that I find across ESG and across clients that we work with is positive impact and what that means and how can we share that. And that's why we love webinars like this too. So I think that's another really great idea of sharing into 2021. Um, Natalie, same for you. 2021, you hit, you know, net zero. You know, what 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 does next year look like for you? Yeah. 
Um, we're focusing on a couple of principles, and this is true across both the um, sustainability and social impact side of things. Um, but local impact, really understanding our communities, the neighborhoods that we're in and having a local impact and um, additionality. So spurring new solutions, environmental and social solutions where they don't exist already. Where I think we're doing that pretty well right now with our in-house in innovation pipeline that's in place operationally where what's new and we're spending, I'm spending a lot of time right now is partnering with our investment team and looking externally to make um, impact, start making some impact investments and spinning up a, an impact investing platform so that we can help grow solutions, whether that's uh, climate tech solutions that we can use in our buildings that aren't scaled yet and we, we could use them. And by the way, and that will have great impact on the world and we can make money. We think there's this now is a great time to be investing in these solutions. So let's focus on that. Um, and then that's true also on the, the social side. There's some really interesting innovations, particularly in the housing space right now, which is about, I think, about on the cusp of real transformation in the same way as, as green buildings as in climate tech. So um, moving towards um, scaling new innovative solutions um, that help us advance sustainability, health and equity in our communities. I love that also. Um, awesome. I think 2021 is going to be a, a good year. I'm excited. Um, and then actually, Erin, from your standpoint too, like what are you hearing across our clients and, or maybe what are you excited about? Cause I mean, I think we, we get into a lot of the weeds and the details sometimes, but, um, what are you kind of most excited for hitting into 2021? I think I'm just excited for the level of engagement I've seen this year more than any, like people are ready. Like they're like, I'm going to the table and I'm bringing my, like, this is what I want to do. And this is, these are the conversations I'm going to have. And it just seems like it's more powerful than this year than it has been in the past. Like there is like extra oomph behind what people are saying and, and why they think it's important. So I think all of these like social, the climate risk, like everything, like it's, so relevant that I think it's giving everyone like an extra leg up on pushing these initiatives through where past years it might not have been an option to. Absolutely. I think that's what I'm looking forward to. We'll, we'll take the excitement. Um, yeah. well, well, Dan, I'll, I'll have you uh, bring us home here. I'll, I'll ask you the two questions. The, the one will be, you know, we expect some potential, you know, new things coming out into 2021. I know in March you guys come out with updates, but as you're planning to address, you know, 2020 and what that means for 2021 reporting, I'm curious to know, you know, how you're going to, what, what's next for Grez in terms of communicating those, those things out to us. And with that, what are you most excited about as well? So I'm most excited that I think we're going to leave everything stable. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We right. are too. We're recorded. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we locked ourselves into this annual change thing, and, and part of it is because we're trying to propel the industry forward, right? And we, we want to meet the needs of the leaders, right? But we also have some folks that are that are just getting into the system, and that creates some tension. So I realized a couple of years ago that Gresb is really a two-year change cycle, and we've had a heck of a year. So let's just take a take a, a time out here, right? And so you're not going to see a whole lot of big revolution from us. It's going to be a lot like 2020, only better, right? More and more stable. Where I think Res shines is shared purpose and using what I term as behavioral economics to create this competitive at the top. So propelling that and keeping that momentum uh, down that track is really important to us, right? Because I think with, with that shared purpose, what everybody I sense wants are better outcomes for their companies and their clients, as well as their communities and their kids. So if we can keep the direction going that way and bring more people along, we had 1,230 this year, I'd like to see that number go up by another 20%, but we never know. Right? We never know who's going to show up in, in the assessment year on year. Sometimes we have companies that are public and go private. Sometimes there's a private equity fund that uh, liquidates, right, or whatever. So hopefully we capture that momentum and, and keep it going, and we bring that shared purpose to more folks. That's really our goal. Well, um, I think this was really um, 
both engaging. So we appreciate everyone's thoughts and feedbacks. And um, I'm personally excited for 2021 for kind of all the reasons that everyone indicated and um, looking to see what this industry can really continue to do. Each year, I'm always, you know, very humbled at um, what we've seen really in the impact it can have. So um, thank you to our, our panelists. Thank you to um, all, everyone that joined us for today. Thank you to the industry for, for joining as well. Um, for those of you that asked questions that we didn't get to, we will try to answer separately from at least our perspective. Um, and we'll also send this recording around um, to everyone who joined. But thank you again. Everyone have an amazing holiday season and um, we appreciate your time today. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.